How are you, Miss Sutherland? I'm doing well. Can't complain. That's Getting ready to go to a conference this weekend. Where are you going? To the Fancy Conference um, in Orlando, Food and Nutrition Conference and Expo. I'm glad that you're doing, uh, that you're getting yourself out there and doing things like that. <laughs> Making yourself marketable. That's what it's all about. Yeah. Makes it easier when you graduate. Absolutely. So you guys, um, I'm going to go ahead and start while I am waiting for uh, Dr. Burns. Um, and I'm just going to go through the regular session wrap up. Um, so, of course, today, uh, first off, if you're, if this is your 1st time coming to a student engagement within the college of ag science and technology. Uh, my name is Dr. Alex Meredith, and I am the director of um, the office of student engagement within the college of ag science and technology. So, we have ongoing uh, forums throughout the semester um, geared towards. Um, Geared towards engagement with alumni, um, advanced studies like today, um, industry, as well as professional development topics. Just some uh, small housekeeping. Of course, the room locks at 1105. Um, I, do, I still do have access to let students in, but it just does that automatically. We ask for you to have your camera on for professionalism for our guest. Um, definitely, if you are a DSU class 1890 Ag Scholar, your camera should be on. Um, because we definitely value uh, the individual's time for coming in um, and definitely when you are asking a question um, so that the presenter can see who they're talking to. Um, please stay muted unless you are asking a question. Um, definitely utilize the raised uh, hand feature as well. And then also, if you can uh, follow us online with these three different platforms, either with the Office of Student Engagement and or the DSU CAS 1890s Ag Scholarship Program itself. Uh, the last, the winner from the last uh, student engagement is Erica Acox, um, a junior uh, forensic biology major. And Erica, I actually emailed you last night and if you, and, and also left you my cell phone. So if you are here, um, just connect with me today and you can stop by my office um, to pick up um, your $10 Amazon gift card. Another announcement, um, I'm also the program director for the DSU-CAS 1890 Ag Scholarship Program. Um, it's uh, up to $3,000, um, it's up to, up to $3,000 worth of um, educational assistance um, for the scholar. Um, we've actually extended it this year from Ag and Natural Resources, Textiles and Food and Nutritional Sciences um, to also include related majors um, like financial, um, financial and business management, Computer science and IT, um, engineering and non medical biological sciences. So definitely screenshot this and or you can hit up the uh, actual scholarship web the website or web page on um, on CAS website um, and it actually closes on November 11th. Um, for awarding in spring of 2023. Uh, students, if you like, because I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Burns and NYU. Um, this is actually the survey link. I am going to drop it in the chat as well, as well as the QR code for the survey. Um, of course, you would do this if you are interested in uh, the $10, well, it was Wawa gift card, but now they're Amazon gift cards. If you're interested in that drawing and or also if you are attending and need uh, your attendance captured for one reason or another. So this is definitely the QR code as well as um, the survey link. Also, if it's actually on a timer from 11.50 a.m. to 12.30 p.m. And during this time is the only time that you can actually um, access the survey. Um, if you go before 11.50, this is what you'll get, an error message. If you go after 12.30, this is also what you'll get. So we don't reset timers uh, or reset the survey. So I really encourage you to uh, make sure that you um, Take care of it during that time period. I'm curious. Uh, let me stop sharing. But, um, is Mr. Chris Wilson here? He said he was going to drop in. No, Mr. Chris Wilson. Okay, so um, Dr. Burns.
Sorry, I was fiddling around and trying to unmute. Hello, thank you no, for no having us. No problem at all. So I just wanted to introduce you. And I actually, I wanted to, um, Chris actually said that he was gonna come today. So he might trickle in in a little while, but um, you guys, just a little bit of a backstory. Um, Chris, Mr. Chris Wilson, he actually is one of my high school classmates from Dover High School. And then he also is a fellow DSU alum. And so he was definitely able to link myself and Dr. Burns with this extremely, uh, this awesome opportunity. There's never been a time that there's been a connection like this as far as between NYU and Dell State, um, especially for something uh, as specific as uh, dentistry. So we do have students that are online that are interested in going to dental school. And I also got to talk with Dr. Kwame Matthews. He even said that he has some vet majors that are specifically want to um, work with animals and dentistry. So um, I don't, you might get some questions like that as well. Um, but this is Dr. Um, Burns, and um, she's an assistant professor um, at NYU College of Dentistry. And I'm going to turn it over to her. Okay, thank you all for being here. Um, yeah, I'll tell you a little bit about myself and then maybe I can engage the interest in dentistry in the room. And then um, I'll hand it over to our um, NYU dental students who are representing the Student National Dental Association to tell you a bit more about dentistry and answer any questions you might have for dental students. So, um, as Dr. Meredith mentioned, my name is Dr. Laurel Burns. I'm originally from Nashville, Tennessee. Um, I went to a math and science high school there, um, Martin Luther King Magnet. And then after finishing high school, I moved to the East Coast to Philadelphia, where I went to college at the University of Pennsylvania. And I entered college already knowing that I was interested in pursuing dentistry. Um, so I, I was on this pre-dental track, although I majored um, in something called health and societies, but had a pre-dental focus. And then immediately after graduating from college, I started dental school um, here at NYU College of Dentistry. And dental school's four years, so I completed that program. And while I was in dental school, I decided that I was interested in one of the dental specialties, and, and you'll learn more about the specialties in our presentation today. Um, and so I decided to pursue the specialty of endodontics which requires some training after dental school. So I moved back to Philadelphia and went back to the University of Pennsylvania and pursued uh, two more years of training in um, the specialty of endodontics. And then after completing that, I decided that I wanted my career to um, involve more than, than just um, you know, practicing clinical dentistry, that I had interest in research and I had interest in teaching. And so I decided that a career in academia would allow me to do all of those things, afford me the opportunity to practice um, clinically, to, um, to investigate the research questions I had interest in and to teach and mentor um, students to come. So I, I started working here at NYU College of Dentistry um, and I've been here on the faculty for five years now. And so I'm excited to, to share what I can with you guys. Um, so, so that's a bit about me. Um, let's kind of just gauge the room. How many of you here, I don't need, I'm not sure how many people are here total, but how many are, have an interest in dentistry? I don't know if you, there's like an emoji you can put up or you guys can shout out. You guys, there is a raise hand feature. Um, right below on the right hand side where it says share. Okay. All right. Um, so I see at least 2 to 3 hands. How many on this call are pre med or think that they're interested in pursuing medicine. Okay, and then I see at least 2 hands there. So for you pre med folks. Um, we may be able to convert you the, the, you know, the pre med pre dental requirements are very similar um, where things differ is the admissions test. So, if you've already started on this pre med track, um, you know, you're well on your way to being pre dental as well. So, so we're happy to answer um, any questions that you might have for people who are kind of on the line. They're right now mainly considering um, a medical school approach, but willing to entertain the thought of dentistry. And I know a lot of us have considered um, 
the two the two pathways and we'd be happy to answer that as well. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce um, student Dr. Lindsay Marshall, who is going to share her screen and give you guys a quick overview of the profession of dentistry um, so that you have a little bit more context. And then we can stay on to answer questions that you may have for us. Lindsay, are you there? Yes, good morning, everyone. Um, so my name is Lindsay Marshall. Um, I am a third year student at NYU College of Dentistry. Um, I'm originally from Florida, so New York is a little bit far from me. It's really my first experience with seasons, so I'm getting used to that still. Um, I went to college in Miami. I studied dietetics and nutrition. Um, unlike Dr. Burns, I did not have uh, uh, the mindset that I was going to be a dentist going into college. I really wanted to pursue nutrition, um, but as I went through the classes, I slowly started to realize, like, maybe I didn't really want to do that. Maybe dentistry was more for me. And that's when I started shadowing. And then it just kind of solidified the process as school went on. Um, we also do have some other students here today. Oh, sorry. Um, we also do have some other students here today. We have um, two first year students. Um, so they can tell you their, like, probably a little bit better, their journey from undergrad straight into dental school. And then we also have um, some second year students as well. Um, so let me go ahead and share this screen. Let me see. Okay. Ooh, it says I need a desktop app to share my screen. I don't know. Let me see. I don't. Dr. Meredith, are you able to help with this? We're having difficulty sharing the screen. Yep. Uh, I can email you the share, share. Let's see. Yeah. I can email you the um Okay, that can be a good backup, but I'm also looking on here because I know this morning when I was setting up, mm -hmm. I passed the feature and I thought it was turned on. It normally yeah. it is. Um, yeah, it says I need to download a desktop app to be mm. able to do it. So I can, it will probably just be easier just email it to you. That's fine. Um, <laughs> Let me just get here. I have my email up. Okay, one second. Mm -hmm. Sent it. Hold on. Cancel. <clears throat> you should have it now. Okay. Apology, our system is scanning it. Okay. So, Mm. Usually, I'm the type that is <clears throat> covers all bases. <laughs> like, if it can happen, it will happen. Uh, I can also just try to send it to you. Yeah, because right now it's on any PowerPoint. Machine. 
Yeah, I, I'll send it to you in PowerPoint and see okay. if that's a little bit faster. Can you do me one favor? Yes. Can you try to share one more time? Okay, I just sent it to you in PowerPoint. Yeah, it just says switch to desktop app and then it tries to get me to download something. Okay. At least, I mean, uh, next time I'm going to have some elevator music. <clears throat> uh, okay. Okay. I think I'm able to share. So I can. Yeah, I saw that. Well, okay, because I just. Or do you have it? Uh, well, it's uh, letting me, of course, because I have Gmail too. So it's. Are you, go right ahead. If you're able to share, Dr. Burns, you can go right ahead. Okay. <clears throat> Try and pull this up. Okay, you guys can see. And then, yes. uh, Lindsay, I, I'll know when to, to switch slides, but you can prompt me if I'm missing the cues. Okay, perfect. Um, so, um, as Dr. Burns explained, we are from a an organization at NYU College of Dentistry called the Student National Dental Association. Um, so, this is a club for minority students, and um, basically, it's just surprise to provide support, mentorship, and other things, uh, among other things at the club, at the school. Um, so this is really where um, primarily the black students kind of, you know, uh, congregate and we're able to support one another. Um, so uh, we can go ahead to the next slide. Okay. So what is dentistry? So a dentist is, is just is a science and a clinician dedicated to the highest standards of health through prevention, diagnosis, treatment, and treatment of oral disease. So I know a lot of times, um, you know, you hear a dentist and you think, okay, they just drill and they fill and that's kind of it, but that's not all that we do. Um, our education is very vast. Uh, we take very similar classes to medical students because not only are we dealing with the oral our oral cavity or our mouths everything kind of plays together so it's important that we have a general knowledge and understanding of how the whole body works um so as as the slide says you know we are highly sophisticated health professionals who do have a wide range of knowledge about our overall health um I think one of the great things about dentistry is that we can provide direct patient care, um, but not only can we provide patient care, we can do things like Dr. Burns does, who does uh, research, and you can also do things with public health and international health. You're not just um, kind of boxed into one uh, sole thing that you can do. So some things to consider if you are considering dentistry, um, dentist, usually like things like science or they like working with their hands or they're artistic they also like helping and interacting with others and also learn enjoy learning new things there's constantly new research that's being put out so as a health professional regardless of if you go the dental route the physician route nursing anything like that it's very important to make sure that you're constantly staying up to date on the new research because things are always ongoing and always changing um, so some career options so for dental school um, after you do your four years of undergrad then you go you can apply to dental school which is four years 
So once you do the, you complete your four years, um, you are able to graduate as a, with a doctorate degree. And in certain states, you're able to practice immediately outside of school as a general dentist. So approximately 80% of dental school graduates do decide to go the general route. Now there are specialties that you could kind of go into. Um, so that includes like Dr. Burns endodontics. Um, there's also um, like orthodontists. So anybody who's had braces has probably um, visited an orthodontist. There's pediatric dentists. There are periodontists, there's someone called a prosthodontist, and then there are also oral surgeons. Maybe you might have visited one if you had your wisdom teeth taken out, um, among other specialty, like subspecialties. So approximately 20% of graduates go those routes as well. Um, so as we were saying earlier, an endodontist is someone who does root canals. Um, so I'm not sure if anyone has ever heard of a root canal or has ever had of a root canal, but essentially, uh, when a tooth has a, and has a cavity and it progresses so far, you start to damage the nerve. So when you have a root canal, you're essentially removing the dead nerve or the, the dead tooth material that's on the inside and you're filling it with another material so that you can maintain the tooth and how, uh, removal of infection. Um, next is oral and maxillofacial pathology. So this specialty really deals with um, like any type of like tumor tumors or anything that's occurring in the oral cavity. Um, they're going to be the ones who are kind of looking under the microscope to figure out what's actually going on. What is the cause of this? What is the origin of this? Uh, then we have the oral and maxillofacial radiology. So that's going to be dealing with uh, various uh, forms of like x-rays, like different like CT scans, um, just kind of seeing what's going on. This uh, specialty kind of works hand in hand um, with the pathology as well as general dentist, because when a general dentist identifies a lesion, then you're going to go through the necessary steps to kind of figure out what is this? Is this something that is benign, meaning like it's not like ever growing, it's not spreading, or is it something that's malignant, meaning like it's traveling to other places in the body. Um, and then we have oral and maxillofacial surgery. Um, so this is kind of what you guys would refer to as like an oral surgeon. So I know my first experience with an oral surgeon is I had all four of my wisdom teeth taken out at once. And I was able to be put to sleep because I was too scared to be awake while they were pulling my teeth. Um, so that was my first experience with the oral surgeon. But oral surgeons, really, they deal with anything in the from the head and neck region. Um, so this would be someone like they often deal with plastic surgery or if there's some type of trauma to the face, like an oral surgeon could be there to kind of help figure out what the plan is to help restore the patient back to their original form. Orthodontics, I'm sure many of you guys have heard of an orthodontist. If you've ever had braces, this is the, this is the um, specialty that really deals with um, restoring our teeth back into uh, proper occlusion or kind of proper, like straight, essentially. And then pediatric dentist. So these are dentists who specifically see um, children up until I think age 18. Um, that is just their specialty. I think this is a really good specialty, especially because the dentist can be very scary. So if you have a professional that's geared towards children that makes things a little bit less scary, that can always help with better outcomes for patients. And then we have periodontics. So I had never heard of a periodontist until I came to dental school. Um, I think the easiest way to describe this is this is a like gum and bone doctor. Um, so everyone knows that we have our gums or gingiva that kind of surround our teeth. So when you brush your teeth at night, you're removing the bacteria that's there. And sometimes if you're missing an area, you might notice that the gums in that area start to get red and puffy and a little bit swollen. So that's called gingivitis. That's the beginning stage and that's reversible. So you just have to make sure you're brushing and you're flossing in that area better. But if it keeps going 
and you don't really get to floss in that area too much and there's more buildup then an inflammatory process or a large swelling process can start to happen and the attachment where our gums and our teeth meet can start to create these pockets and when you start having pockets the gums start receding or going away from the tooth and that's why you see on the left hand side of the screen you see a tooth at the bottom that looks kind of normal and then at the top you see like a really far up gum that's happening because the gums are just receding because the person probably wasn't doing a very good job of brushing and keeping that area clean. So the periodontic department deals with kind of restoring our gums to a healthy form. And they also deal with implants. And then we have a prosthodontic, the prosthodontic uh, specialty. This one is another one I also had never heard of until I came to dental school. I would kind of call these, uh, this specialty, the orchestra, like the, the person who kind of orchestrates everything. So prosthodontics deals with like using um, like dentures. I don't know if any of your grandparents have dentures or anything that they can kind of remove. Uh, this specialty kind of deals with restoring the mouth completely. So this specialty you really relies on partnerships with a, all the other specialties. So they might need um, someone from orthodontics to kind of help straighten the existing teeth that are still there. Um, they might need someone from periodontics to put implants in to kind of help a denture to not pop up. Um, they might need a general dentist to do um, like, you know, cleanings before you start everything else. So this, this specialty really kind of encompasses everyone to restore function and form. Um, so what is dental school like? So like I explained to you earlier, uh, it is a four-year program. So you can do your four years at school and you can graduate and be a general dentist um, in certain states. Um, and it includes courses that are similar to like the pre-med path. So you have your biological sciences. So like your biology courses, like your anatomy, your physiology, biochem, micropharmacology, um, if your school offers any oral courses, that would be really cool because it just kind of exposes you, exposes you to it a little bit earlier. Um, you also have to do your clinical sciences. Um, so we do like preventional care. So we talk about like the basis, like oral health. So we talk about how is the proper way to instruct a patient to brush their teeth? Like what are things that patients can do <clears throat> to avoid having to come to the dentist to have to get like a uh, cavity filled or anything like that. We also learn about diagnosis. It's very important that your dentist understands when they're seeing something that looks abnormal, what it could be so that you can get treatment early or that they can intervene before things escalate a little bit further. Um, we talk about treatment planning. So it's important that we understand the proper um, routes for planning treatment so that we can um, ensure that our patients are healthy. Um, <clears throat> and then other aspects of clinical dentistry, just as a clinician, it's important that you understand how to provide dental care, how to speak to your patients and how to explain things effectively. Um, we also have courses that directly are related to practicing of dentistry. So like I explained before, working with patients from many cultural backgrounds, I think that's a very big one. I think that it's important to understand how to speak to a, a wide variety of patients because you may think you're explaining something well in your culture, but to somebody else, you may be you may not be explaining it very well. Ethics and professionalism, I feel like those are at the center of being a health professional because essentially someone is trusting you with their life. So it's important that you're making ethical decisions while you're treating your patients and also that you're being very professional about it. Um, behavior science, um, that was something I was very shocked to know that we learned about behavior sciences because we are interacting with other humans. So it's important to understand um, the best ways to communicate and things that we should do just to ensure that we have the smoothest process possible. Um, we learn about practice management, which I think is very important, especially for um, those students who do want to go on to eventually own their own practice. It's important to understand kind of what you're getting into.
so that you can run an effective practice. Um, and then we also talk about working with other um, professionals um, because as I explained to you before, just because we only work in the oral cavity doesn't mean that we don't have to coordinate with other healthcare professionals. Often people will have conditions like diabetes or other systemic conditions um, like kidney failure where we do need to be in contact with their physician to make sure that anything that we're doing on our end isn't exacerbating any health issues that they're having. So it's always important to work kind of hand in hand with the physician, uh, especially when you're doing more invasive treatments like extractions or things like that. Um, so what should you do now to prepare to get prepared for dental school? So taking your science classes, your math classes, as well as chemistry and biology, um, this, pro this um, really, I know you guys aren't taking AP classes because you are in college already. So really, I would just say that, you know, if you are like a, a science mate, it's important to basically take the prerequisites um, for dental school. So for me, I didn't, I wasn't a biology major. I wasn't like a traditional major for going into dental school. I studied dietetics and nutrition, which just so happened to be a science major that kind of hit all the prereqs. Um, but I have friends in school right now who majored in like languages, so Spanish, and they are here with me as well. You just have to do it on your own time, kind of. You just have to be able to add in those prerequisites onto your schedules. And also I would recommend finding some type of um, mentor. I think that was kind of where I went wrong in this whole process. I do think if I had a mentor in the health professions, they could have helped me navigate the process a little bit more seamlessly. And then this is just some information where we're just showing you that uh, being a dentist is considered one of the top jobs, uh, not only for pay, but for job satisfaction. I know for me, I chose to go the route of a dentist because I, it was really important to me to be able to interact with my patients and form relationships with my patients. I think my experience with my orthodontist, I had braces for five years, so I was seeing him constantly. Not only was I seeing him constantly for braces, but he was also my basketball coach. So I literally saw him every day for months. And I think the fact that he really knew things about me, like I wasn't just a number to him, that really made a difference to me. And also the fact that a lot of times when you see your dentist, you go in and sometimes you're in pain and a lot of times you leave not in pain. So it's kind of like the, I guess, immediate gratification of being able to really help someone and seeing that you actually help them. So that was, um, those are some things for me that are really meaningful about choosing to be a dentist. Um, and then diversity and dent approximately 55 dentists per 100,000 people. So a goal would be to make the ethnic population of dentistry match that general population. Unfortunately, it doesn't. Uh, in 2012, uh, out of 700, out of 5,483 students, 713, uh, or 13% were accepted to dental school and they identified as Black, Hispanic, American Indian, and Island, Pacific Islander. Um, I think these numbers are very disappointing because as a profession, as a, as a patient, you would want your health professional to reflect you and to understand things that you go through. And unfortunately with these numbers, that's not really the case. Uh, so I know our hopes and kind of exposing you guys to dentistry is just to kind of pique your interest and kind of let you know, you know, this isn't, this is a profession that's out there that you should definitely consider. It's a really great profession. And, you know, hopefully over the next few years, we will see an increase in minority population as dentists. So does anybody have any questions? Uh, definitely feel free to ask. Like I explained, uh, we do have some other dental students here. I'll go ahead and um, introduce them. Um, so first we have Don. He is a D1 or a first year dental student at NYU. Um, you can go ahead and say hi, Don. 
Hey, like uh, like Lindsay said, my name's Don. I'm a D1 at uh, NYU. I went to uh, NC State for my undergrad, and I grew up in North Carolina and Washington State, so kind of grew up on both coasts. Um, and yeah, I just I did want to add something uh, to your presentation, Lindsay, about suggestions for people who are doing the pre dental route. I would say also invest a little bit of time into things that enhance your manual dexterity. You know, I know for me, I've played music and done music for a lot of my life. So if you do have some sort of, you know, artistic talent, you know, musical talent or anything that involves manual de dexterity and, you know, things that'll set you apart in the application process, that'd, that'd also be pretty good. That's a really great point. Um, Thank you, Don. Uh, we also have two second year students with us. So we have Miriam, um, and then we also have Shanique. Um, so you guys can go ahead and introduce yourself. Hi, my name is Miriam. I went to U of I in um, Chicago. I'm not really the traditional um, student. So after um, U of I, I went to do my master's in public health at Tufts. And that's what um, I think I was doing. I was taking a class that basically focused on maternal health. And one of the findings were like, um, I think like women of color um, had, I think they were high, um, in terms of the rankings, they were in, um, how do I explain this in the layman's term? Basically they were um, more at risk of having like um, dental issues when they were pregnant. So that kind of piqued my, piqued my interest into dentistry. So I started shadowing some dentists around the area, started talking to some dental students, and that's how I got into dentistry. So if you have any questions, please um, feel free to ask. And nice meeting you guys. And then we have Shanique. Hi, everyone. My name is Shanique. Um, I'm I grew up in Jamaica. I'm Jamaican. I moved here when I was 19. Went to Lehman College. Uh, I majored in biology, minored in um, business ad. Um, I've always known that I wanted to be a dentist because I uh, grew up, I had dental issues. Um, and so I wanted to give back in that capacity. And so I, I, I decided to, to pursue this. Um, this uh, career, uh, uh, yeah, thank you. <laughs> um, so does anybody have any questions? You can ask us anything about school. Okay, wait, I see a chat, here we go. Um, okay, so Tamia, could you go more into shadowing and how you got into it? Um, sure, so for me, I started shadowing because I was a part of a club in college called the Pre-Dental Society, and they had organized shadowing opportunities. You just needed to sign up for it. Um, so that was kind of my first experience shadowing. I shadowed a general dentist um, who was from Columbia, and she kind of, she did things kind of old school. So everything was paper, all paper charts. She was still, she was using film or for x-rays. So I don't know if you guys know, like kind of everything is digital now. So all of our charts are digital at school and all of our x-rays are also digital. So for me, I had never seen that when I was in undergrad because the dentist I grew up with also had everything digital. So I was so shocked to see she was like writing pencil and paper, like filling in the chart. So that was really interesting to me. Um, I got to see a biopsy my first day and I thought dentistry wasn't for me because I don't like blood and there was a lot of blood. Um, but then I continued shadowing I shadowed an orthodontist um, who was young. So that was really cool because I got to see how getting your practice started worked. And I got to see like how hard he worked and how, how much he was out in his community really trying to show that he was a pillar of the community. He wasn't just there to make money. Like he really wanted to, like he would go out to the PTA meetings. Like he, would, he was really trying to be just a stance in his community. And I, that really, really sat with me. Um, so that's how I got involved with shadowing. But I would definitely say, um, if you know there's something you wanna do, shadow, because that will really show you if you're genuinely interested in it. In high school, I thought I wanted to be a lawyer. I shadowed a lawyer and it wasn't for me at all. So I would definitely reach out to any health professionals that you know. 
it might take a little bit for them to respond to you, but definitely just give it a shot. Um, our next question, can you explain your experiences you faced during your transition from undergrad to graduate school? Um, anyone can take that one. Can I answer that, please? Yeah. Um, so I would say, um, coming from someone who also did her master's, I thought I was ready for dental school. And honestly, um, I think dental school is a different experience on its own. So I'll just talk about dental school in general. Um, it was very challenging the first year, and I think I'm still, Lindsay would be um, a witness to that. We're always complaining to her about how hard things are, um, but it is doable because people have done it before you. So um, as long as you have a mentor, like Lindsay said, and you have some an upperclassman that you can talk to and guide you, I think um, it is possible to kind of get through it. Um, so that's just my opinion on this question. Yeah, I think that's awesome. I There's no way I would have gotten through school if I didn't have someone to talk to about it um, because it's just, it's a lot. It's just different than undergrad. There's just so much more information that like time just feels like it's moving a lot faster. Um, it definitely is a lot, but you it's doable. You just definitely need, you need someone to go through it. You need people, you need like a family to go through it with. And I think with SNDA, that's one of the best things about it is that we do have each other to kind of lean on when we're going through difficult times or like when we're having like any type of difficulties, we can definitely reach out to each other. Um, can you talk about the adjustment from undergrad curriculum to dental school? So I think that kind of goes with what we were saying. I think in undergrad, you could, I mean, you could kind of cram and you'll still pass an exam easily, but in dental school, there's no such thing as cramming. Um, the amount of lectures that we cover on exams is a lot. A lot of times we'll have like 10 lectures on an exam, but the lectures are like 80 slides each. So it's not like you could just cram all of that in the night before and expect to know every single thing, especially because a lot of the information is very, very specific. So I would say the biggest difference is that you really do need to pace yourself in dental school to learn everything and to be able to absorb everything. Um, oh, oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, go ahead. I, was go ahead. Gonna, I was just going to add on to that. Uh, I think taking time to actually schedule your day and your weeks, it, it may come across kind of robotic, but I will literally. I'm you know, making sure that you just have a system in place. And um, yeah, basically just staying organized and making sure you're doing a little bit of something for each class every day. Um, I know for summer semester, it was, uh, it was pretty challenging. It kind of, it kind of felt like you were on a treadmill that was going three miles per hour. Then out of nowhere, you're running 24 miles per hour for, you know, two months straight. So, you know, you, you kind of, it's really easy to get behind. So even if it's just 30 minutes a day of looking over review questions or making notes for certain classes, uh, that would be my uh, biggest suggestion. Also, Lindsay, can I add? Okay, and for me, it took me a semester to figure out how to study because it's a bit different. So you have to understand that like there's a different you have to study for each course differently because different professors they have like different teaching style and I think it took me a semester to figure that out like it's not going to be one set way of studying and yeah I, I tried that I've been trying that and it's <laughs> been much better for me so that's my two cents. Um, our next question, do you guys have any tips or advice on preparing for the DAT? You guys can take that one. Um, yeah, so, uh, what I, I used booster and, uh, what's the book, uh, DAT destroyer. Um, the questions are there on the DAT destroyer really hard. 
they basically destroy your confidence <laughs> but uh it, it, they're really good for kind of getting you over prepared for the exam and the way i did it i each day would be a certain sub subject so for example monday wednesday fridays i would do you know biology chemistry and orgo you know tuesday thursdays pat and you know math you know organizing it in that way and you know sundays doing practice exams I, I would do as many practice exams as you can um also in giving yourself enough time um i i did a gap and i worked i worked at a biotech company and so i was already working 40 to 60 hours a week and it wasn't realistic for me to you know take only a month or two to study so make sure you adjust for that i ended up taking it maybe like three and a half months to study um so yeah giving yourself enough time to study um actually i do i have the dat destroyer to the uh 2021 um i still have it so i'm willing to give it away if someone is studying for the dat right now so i really liked that that book So I use the um, I use the AT bootcamp. That's what it's called, right, guys? The AT boot bootcamp. I really love it because there's every you have everything in one place. Help with admissions, uh, practice questions, lectures. Like it's amazing. Um, for to me, I feel like my DAT the actual exam was it, it was. The format was similar, like the, the practice questions on DAT bootcamp with the format was very similar. And because of that, I was, I was like, yes, <laughs> this is it. This is, this is what I need. Um, so I would recommend DAT bootcamp. Also, uh, study burnout is real. And, um, I had a, a study partner, a virtual study partner, and that really helped. So um, I'm not sure if you guys prefer like a group setting, but if you do, um, I I think that's a good idea to you know do like get a virtual partner if you can't get one in person. But yeah. Um, so I used a mixture of both the DAT boot camp and the DAT booster because I missed. I did a post back after my master's since I wasn't sure I wanted to do dentistry. So afterwards is when I did my post back. So in that post back program, they gave us access to DAT bootcamp. So I purchased, um, I, I purchased the DAT booster and I really loved the DAT booster for the PAT section because it was very challenging on the uh, booster app, but like on the actual exam, it was way easier. So I think if you, I don't know how you guys study, but I think it just depends on how you study as well. If you can maybe have both or either or um, do your research and see whatever works for you and then um, kind of go with that plan, like um, Don said earlier. Yeah, and to just kind of like echo everything that everybody said, I also did the DAT boot camp primarily, um, but I also had purchased one of the destroy. I had an old destroy one of the DAT destroyer books. And then I also bought their organic chemistry book because I knew that that was my weakest area. Like I just, I never enjoyed organic chemistry. So I really wanted to spend a lot of time on it. Um, and also like Dawn said, I did work as well. So I was working 40 hours a week. So I would do my, I would work basically 7.30 to 4.30, give myself an hour when I came home and then I'd study from like 5.30 to like 11 every night. And study burnout is real definitely so you want to make sure that you're giving yourself some grace and really pacing yourself it definitely is not like a sprint it absolutely is a marathon studying for that exam so for those who don't know um it is a i think it's about a four hour exam um and it covers uh like a math section or qualitative reasoning it covers like sciences so there's biology there is um, organic chemistry. There's a perceptual ability session or section as well. So that's kind of like, it's stuff you've really never seen before. Um, so like seeing things kind of in 3D, but they're in 2D. Um, 
as well as a reading comprehension section. So that's all at one time. So it's a, it's a large exam. It's similar to the MCAT in that it's a large exam. So it's definitely something you want to pace yourself when you're studying for, um, but definitely just be patient with yourself. Try to maintain everything else the outside of studying. So like your family, like your friends, try to really balance all of those things because that was something that I didn't do. And it was very detrimental to me in the long run, uh, but I got through it and I'm here. We all got through it and we're here. But if you guys have any questions about that, you can absolutely reach out to us and we can give you some more resource resources or advice. Um, and then we have one more question here. What is a good amount of shadowing hours? So anyone can answer that one. Um. I would say it's depending on the school you're applying to. Um, I think a good range is around 100, if I'm not mistaken. Um, I know for me, it was kind of different because I, I, a lot of my shadowing was during COVID. So, and then uh, the other, the only in-person shadowing I actually had was uh, outside of the country. So I was living in Panama at the time. So. I wasn't, I was not sure if it was going to count or not, but, um, but yeah, a lot of mine was virtual. So, but I, it was easier to kind of accumulate hours that way, but I, I believe it's around a hundred. Um, I would just say the more shadowing you could get the better, to be honest. Um, like I explained to you, I shadowed. I think over the course of shadowing, I think I might have shadowed three different um, dentists, um, the most being with the orthodontist. I think I ended up doing like something crazy, like 500 hours with him, but that was just because I really enjoyed uh, hanging out in the practice and seeing everything he was doing uh, that you definitely don't need that. I also did some other outreaches. I think that's a big thing. I think that dental schools, they know that you're going to shadow a dentist. That's kind of the bare minimum, but they like to see that you're doing other things. So I got involved with a program called Guardian Ad Litem, um, which basically is an advocacy group for um, children that are unfortunately removed from their homes uh, due to legal reasons. Um, so you're basically just advocating for the child because a lot of times when they're going through the court systems, it's just like, there's a lot of ad there's a lot of things going on, but there's no one who's solely there just for the kid or the child. So that was kind of my role. Like I would always go visit the kids wherever they were placed. I would talk to them, see what they really wanted to do. And then whenever things would go to court, like I would be their voice. I would be the one to say, you know what, like I understand the parents are doing X, Y, and Z, or I understand the grandparents or whatever are doing X, Y, and Z, but this is really what the child wants. Um, so that was a really big talking point during my interviews because I think it's just something that you, it, it's kind of out of nowhere that I did that. Um, it's just because I really enjoyed doing that. And I had, I had been working with a uh, underserved community between my time in undergrad and dental school. So it just kind of flowed with what I was doing. It was something I really enjoyed. Um, I think we have one last question. Hopefully we have time. I have a question for Lindsay. Okay. Um, so you said you majored in nutrition dietetics. I'm also majoring currently in nutrition. What made you make the switch from nutrition to um, dental school? Like what was the main reason? What are the differences that you see? Um, so for me personally, I was just kind of discouraged by, um, I guess, how the career path worked as a dietitian. Um, I didn't like that you would constantly be questioned by other professions that didn't really know much about your profession. Um, that was really the biggest thing. I feel like nutrition and dietetics are so integral in our lives. And unfortunately, the mass majority of the population doesn't get enough education in it. So when you are in the real world and you are the dietitian, I just felt like in my experience, you were just constantly not listened to. And I didn't like that. I really wanted to be able to help people. And I, I wanted someone to like really respect like my, like my advice or things like that. So I think that's kind of where it came from. Um, but like I said, I love nutrition. Like at my core, I love nutrition. I love dietetics. I loved everything about it. I just really hated that aspect of it. But I will say that 
since I graduated till now, all of my friends that are dietitians, they have been able to do so much. And I think things are slowly getting better in that field. So that's really, really helped um, just with the progression of the field in general. So that was my reasoning back then. Would I have the same decision making now? I'm not sure, but that was my reasoning then. Um, the transition wasn't hard because like I said, at my school, it was a science major. So I was able to take all the prereqs to go either way. Um, sorry, we have one more question. What do you think, what things do you think pre-dental students can do to make our application stand out? Uh, I think that's, that's, that's a difficult question. I think just trying to, you know, do your best in school is really a great thing as well, um, as kind of getting out in the community, doing things that really matter to you. Like I said, they're going to expect you to shadow a dentist, but if you're really passionate about like something I think showing that you're passionate about something, you're not just a robot, you're not just a number on a paper, like you're a real person, showing that you're well-rounded. I think those are things that really make um, students stand out on their applications. Um, and then also when you're writing your essays, like write about something that you're generally passionate about. They see a million essays of people saying, oh, I had an orthodontist and I loved my orthodontist. Like write something that's a little bit out of the box that, that you're truly passionate about because I guarantee you they'll be able to feel the passion through the words. So that is what I would recommend for that one. Um, and then is it normal to take a gap year between dental school? I don't know if anybody wants to talk about that. I think all of us took some type of time between dental school and undergrad. Yeah, I can. Um, I took two years um, because after my master's, I did my post back and I worked for a year. So it is normal. And honestly, looking back, I'm really happy I took those two years off because the four years is a marathon. So you want to make sure you're mentally prepared um, for what's ahead. Um, so yeah, it is normal. I took two years, and I'm sure other my other colleagues took a gap year as well. So yeah. Just to add quickly, um, if you feel like you don't want to do that and you're on a roll and you just want to keep the momentum going, do that. If that's if that works for you, you can do that as well. I have a friend who did that and she's doing well and I don't think she regrets it. Yeah, a thousand percent. If you can do it, do it. I just couldn't do it. I was burnt out at the end of undergrad. I, I needed time off to just kind of recoup and refocus on everything. So that was why I chose to take, um, I took two years off as well. I worked during those two years, but everybody has their own journey. So I would say definitely try not to compare. Um, comparison is really the thief of all joy. So definitely just try to focus on you. Um, everybody has a different journey everybody will make it to their end goal, but just remember everyone has a different journey and just to keep, continue to keep working, stay encouraged, reach out. If you're feeling like you're having a difficult time, speak to someone who's going through the same thing. Like you guys can help pull each other up and just stay focused, but it's definitely anything is possible, you know, as long as you continue to work towards it. I think that was our last question, Dr. Meredith. Okay. Um, I, I just want to mention one other thing. And I mentioned, um, I actually talked with the scholars, uh, I think it was on Tuesday, the days are moving so fast with their um, midterm check in. And there was a really good um, clip. It's really, really short um, that Steve Jobs shared. And um, he said that most people don't get their experiences because they don't ask, right? And so he mentioned how when he was 12 years old that he literally called up Bill Hewlett, um, Hewlett Packard at the age of, well, I already said 12, but um, he said he was still in the phone book. And he mentioned that he wanted to, um, to create a frequency counter parts. And so, um, and asked if he would send him the parts. And after he did send him the parts, he also, um, Bill actually offered him a summer internship um, building um, frequency counters. So um, definitely, I mean, somebody that's the most closest to you uh, when it comes to being able to ask and shadow, 
you know, sometimes one option, and I know the students did mention, could definitely be your own personal um, dentist. I know I had my dentist from once, uh, well, as a child up into age 18, and then I switched over and was with another practice my whole adult life. So um, that relationships and relationships like that can definitely be um, mostly beneficial because sometimes we just need to be empowered. Um, students, uh, the survey link is definitely in the chat. I do want you guys to make sure that you thank um, NYU Dentistry uh, Student uh, National Dental Association with some hands or claps um, because they could definitely be studying right now and they're here working with um, Delaware State University students that definitely have um, an interest in, um, in, dentist in dentistry. Um, students, are there any more questions that you might have for NYU? None? Okay. Um, Dr. Burns, is it okay for um, for students to have access to like an email or anything that they might <clears throat> um, have questions about after the fact that they might not have thought about right now? You might be on mute. Um, we can definitely share our email with you. <laughs> All um, right, thank you so much. Yeah, most definitely. I, I definitely appreciate that. Should I email them all to you or do you want us to put it in the chat, which is easier? Um, you could actually just put uh one of them in the chat. Uh, okay. If you possibly could and Okay, I'll put mine in the chat. Okay. And then if you like if anybody has any specific questions for anybody else, I can just get them in contact with them. Okay. And also, Dr. Burns, um, I made sure uh, uh, individuals that participate in um, these types of engagements with students, um, you also get um, a survey um, that you know helps guide um, my programming and your feedback and our engagement. So it should get to you. It's on a timer sometime today. Um, but I really, really wholeheartedly appreciate um, NYU for being here. Thank you so much for having us. I think she might be having some issues with the Wi Fi, but yes, thank you so much for having us. We're really appreciative. Like anything that we can do, like I said before, please reach out to us. Like we will get back to you. We can help you with anything, anything. Definitely, we want to see more students that look like us here. So, anything that we can do to help that, we will absolutely do that. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you guys for having us again. All right. Well, students, I'll let you go to your next class. And also, if you need any assistance from my office, of course, you can definitely reach out because many of you are, um, this is actually your first engagement. So I'm also going to put my, my email in the chat as well. All right. Well, you guys enjoy your day. And uh, yeah, I'll definitely, um, definitely follow up in one, um, in one regard or one regard or another. Thank you so much. Oh, anytime. Thank you. I really appreciate it. And so do the students. Definitely the students do as well. Good luck to you guys uh, for applying and everything. Thanks, Lindsay. Okay. Thanks, guys. And also, Dr. Burns, uh, this is being recorded. Would you like a copy of it? Uh, sometimes some industry, you're not industry, but they do come in, they like snippets and things of that nature, but. Lindsay, do you have any need? I'm okay, but if you want the recording. Okay. No, I'm okay. We're good. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thanks so much. I hope this met your, your needs, uh, Dr. Meredith. Oh yeah, most definitely. You guys touch on all points. On top of that, um, I got to learn, uh, I definitely have known about gingivitis. I'm not saying I have the prettiest teeth, but um, I'm serious about um, dentistry and yeah. And I was always wondering about what endodontics was. So I'm glad that it definitely got covered as well. And I enjoy reading your research. So please continue to send it to me because there's a lot of similarities between um, DEI at NYU as well as DEI at DSU um, that, you know, I definitely can use across uh, disciplines. Yeah, and maybe there'll be some opportunities for us to collaborate or something. Yes, yes. Yeah, um, so, so I my have everything in mind. Yeah, my dissertation um, is more or less like qualitative. 
um, in how to serve underrepresented minorities. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, most yeah, and I think that that perceived barriers paper that you're asking me about that's qualitative and we're, we do some work on like that. So, if you want to collaborate on something of that nature, you know, just keep me in mind and we can do something. Okay. Yeah. All right. All right. All right. Take care. Guys, and also, you know what? This is totally off. Um, I, one thing that I learned about you is when you just said that you were from Nashville. And so usually I can from uh, from like living in Illinois, Texas, North Carolina. I wasn't able to pick up on your accent, but um, yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, but, you know, I grew up mostly partially in uh, Chicago, and that's where my family's from. Oh. So I didn't move to Nashville until I was about ten. So I may have already like developed um, um, like my speech by then, but I don't know. It depends. Like I think it depends on certain words people pick it up. Oh, okay. And I also went to Carbondale. So we used to always go up to Chicago at least once a month, but mm -hmm. great food. Um, <laughs> yeah, most definitely. Awesome. Most definitely. Right. Well, we'll right. touch and you take care. Okay. You too. All right. Bye. Bye-bye.